Okay, welcome to Psych 236, um, Developmental Psychology. Today, uh, we're talking about adolescence and we're talking about psychosocial development. So more of the psychological stuff, not so much the cognitive stuff or the biological stuff, it's more cognitive stuff, I mean, more psychological stuff, which is more interesting. So let's get to that because there is a bunch of stuff. We're not gonna finish it all today. We're gonna break it up into two lectures, two videos. Okay, so we'll talk about theories of adolescence, We'll talk about identity, which is very important and very relevant to today's time, especially today's time, right? Uh, we'll talk about family and friends and uh, communication about sex under family and friends. When we get to that, that's where we'll stop, okay? And then we'll talk about other things like health issues and drugs. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, just first, some theories of adolescence. These should be simple and we'll get those out of the way. Uh, one person you probably haven't heard of this, G. Stanley Hall. Um, not really going to go over his theory. We haven't really been going over his, his theory, but uh, just want to point out what he said about adolescence, what he believed. According to G. Stanley Hall, adolescence is a period of storm and stress. He believed that teens are moody. In other words, they change, emotions change rapidly, right? How they feel changes rapidly. They can feel bummed out or very excited or very angry uh, with little warning, right? He believes teens are, are untrustworthy. Right, you can't really trust them. They say one thing, they do something else. Right, they lie a lot. Uh, they, you know, they they hide things. You know, they go behind their parents' back and tell their parents they're actually doing something else. You know, what they're actually doing. Um, he said that basically the teenage years are characterized by inevitable turmoil. There's a lot of problems, a lot of maladjustment, a lot of tension, rebellion, dependency, uh, delinquency. There's conflicts, right, and exaggerated peer group conformity that adolescents basically care too much about being just like everybody else, about dressing a certain way and believing certain things and acting a certain way just because it's popular. That's what he said, okay? Uh, he's had some very bad things to say about teenagers, okay? And, um, you know, we'll talk about whether this is actually the case. Are all teenagers really that bad or the average teenager? Or is this just only the troublesome ones, right? Is this typical of adolescents? Let's talk about other theories and what other theories say. Freud's theory, right? Uh, remember for Freud's theory, right? Uh, adolescence uh, is really that last stage of Freud's theory, okay? So according to Freud, adolescence is a time when there's strong sexual urges, when those urges reemerge and they're directed toward other people, okay? They reemerge. Remember that Freud said that uh, the uh, sexual urge first emer emerges during the phallic stage, which is about, you know, three or four to about five or six, right? Um, and then it's suppressed. And then it, it, may, it get, emerges again during adolescence. But now you're supposed to direct those, those sexual impulses toward other people, not toward mommy and daddy. Remember the Electra complex, Oedipus complex, right? We're beyond that now, right? These sexual urges must be uh, used to develop a mature adult relationship that includes commitment, caring, compromise, not just sex, a mature relationship, according to Freud, is not just one that is physical. It's not just sex, it's not just hormones, right? It's not just those urges. And you learn that, okay, eventually, um, as you get older, right? At first you get into a lot of trouble or maybe you uh, go about it the wrong way with those relationships. And all you care about is like that he or she looks good, right? Because you're dri being driven by hormones. Eventually you learn that, you know what? Other things matter, right? Are they committed to you? Do they care about you? Are they good people? Do they compromise? Do they help you, right? Um, if you're really going to stay with somebody for a long time, you'll learn to care about other things. And then you'll learn that actually there's other things that are more important than actually looks, more important than those uh, hormonal things, more important than the physical stuff. And you learn that as you get old, older to trial and error, as you get your heart broken here and there, and you run into some bad people that are very shallow, right? But that's what happens when you only care about looks. You get into trouble, right? Other things like personality also matter. That's what Freud said, okay? And uh, so far, it seems like, you know, nothing real, con really controversial about adolescence. Uh, all these theorists seem to understand more or less what is going on. According to Eric Erickson, right? Adolescence is uh, a time really to resolve identity. So the stage that corresponds to Erickson's uh, theory that has to do with adolescence is identity versus role confusion. So, ident so identity is the major thing uh, that needs to be resolved during adolescence. The question, right, of who am I, who will I be? That's the central question during adolescence, according to Erickson. 
Colonel Erickson, we strive to achieve an identity and we give up, you know, repudiate all other identities. Eventually, right, uh, you need to figure out who you are and what you're going to do with yourself. And you're going to give up those other identities, right? Because you might experiment a little bit. And maybe you try being a jock, right? Being an athlete. Maybe you try being the cool and popular type or the party type or whatever. Eventually, you figure out who you are and you stop messing around with those other identities because they are not who you are, right? Maybe eventually you find out that, hey, you're just the nerdy type, right? You're not the cool type. You're just the nerdy type. You're going to do well in school. You're going to move on to college and, you know, eventually hopefully get a good job. And that's who you are, right? You're not this other kind of person who's an athlete or the cool type or the party type you need to figure out who you are that's the main goal of identity according to erickson if you're unable to repudiate if you're unable to kind of give up those other identities or you can't figure out who you are that will mean according to erickson that you really can't keep a job you'll have no loyalty to any job you don't know who you are so you'll try this or that you don't know where to go right and what to do with yourself what career to take no loyalty to friends or significant others. You're going to be changing, right? You know, you're going to try one thing, then another, hanging out with these people and that people. And, uh, you know, and you're going to leave people behind. You're going to change, right? You're going to dump people left and right because, uh, you know, you thought they were right for you. And it turns out they're not because you're, you're not who you thought you were, right? And they're not right for you. You want to have your options open, you know, because you don't know who you are. So you're going to keep changing, keep trying out different things, no loyalty, right? And um, that's not good, right? You have to find out who you are if you're going to get anywhere in life. If you just keep changing and you keep trying different things, what you'll find is the years will go by and you won't get anywhere, okay? And there you are, 40 years old, and you still don't have a degree. You still haven't, you know, found a career, right? You're still working on it, so to speak, right? But you have to find out who you are so you know what to do with yourself and eventually who to settle down with. Identity is very important. Um, so during adolescence, it's a time of indecision about identity. You're supposed to be worried about who you are. You're supposed to care about that. It's supposed to bother you. And you're supposed to think about it. Tolerance of this indecision leads to identity, right? If you are worried about it, that means you're going to think about it and eventually you're going to figure out your identity. But if you're intolerant about that, uh, about that indecision, right, uh, that anxiety, you know, that, uh, if you're intolerant about identity or, you're, or you, don't, you can't um, deal with that indecisiveness, then what's going to happen is, is you're going to make up your mind right away about who you are or maybe not resolve an identity, right? Uh, it, one thing that it can lead to is premature foreclosure. When you can't take uh, these, you know, that indecision about identity, that conflict, right? When, it, when you can't take that, what you do is you basically uh, just, uh, you know, resolve your identity by just believing what other people tell you. And then you become what other people tell you you are, right? They might, people might tell you, oh, you're, you know, you're, you know, you're just like this, right? And you should go and be an engineer, right? And that's who you are. And you find out later on that that's not who you are at all, right? But um, you need to think about it for yourself. And if you can't make a decision by, uh, by yourself and you don't want to continue thinking about it, you may just make a decision that is too quick and that's foreclosure, premature foreclosure. You make a decision really that has to do with not with your own thinking, but based on other people's opinion. You have to figure out for yourself who you are. That's what Erickson said. Let's keep going. Um, James Marsha um, took this issue of identity that Erickson talked about and developed it further. So we can really know a lot about who we are if we listen to James Marsha. According to James Marsha, identity involves questioning and commitment. So you have to question your identity. Who am I? Who will I be, right? What am I about? And you have to make a commitment, right? I'm going to decide to be this, right? I'm going to do this with my life, right? So you have to question, you have to think about it, and then you also have to decide. That's what James Marsha said. This, this leads to four possibilities as far as your identity, okay? So questioning, right? You can either question or not question, and you could either commit or not commit. Two times two gives you four, four possibilities. One of those possibilities is identity diffusion. Those are the people who didn't question their identity. They didn't think about it, no questioning, and they didn't commit to anything either. So they have identity diffusion. They don't know who they are, okay? They have few values, few goals. They're not really committed to any type of school or work or anyone. They don't really care right? That's identity diffusion. They're not concerned about their identities and they're not going to make a decision 
they don't care. That is not a healthy thing. Okay, these people are going to end up wasting their time and they're not going to go anywhere. That's what's going to happen to them. And there are those who undergo what's called identity foreclosure, which is also not good. These are the people who don't question who they are, but they commit to an identity. In other words, they just believe what their parents tell them or their church tells them or their political party or whoever's around them. They just agree with them and they don't really question their identity. They don't decide for themselves. They adopt their parents or society's roles without questioning. Maybe they're told, hey man, you are just, you know, you're, we come from a military family and you are the military type. You're gonna go into the military just like your daddy did, just like your mommy did. We're a military family, that's who you are. And you just agree with that and you join the military and you become a military person, you know, let's just say. Or you're gonna take over daddy's business, right? That you're gonna take over the, you know, the family business, right? You have no choice about that. That's who you're gonna be. Or you know what? Maybe it's a conservative family. They're gonna say, you know what? You're a girl, right? You're female. Your job is just to get married and have some kids and raise the kids, right? That's your job. That's all you're gonna be. If you're very religious, you're gonna have very, they're gonna have very strict, uh, very strict rules for you, very rigid rules. And if you just agree with that and accept that, that's identity for closure. You didn't think about it for yourself. You just believe what other people tell you. That is not a healthy thing either. Probably won't be very happy, okay? You're just gonna be whatever other people tell you to be. Identity moratorium is, uh, is not so unhealthy, but it's not the greatest thing either. Identity moratorium is when you questioning has taken place. You're concerned about your identity, you're thinking about it, but you haven't yet made a commitment. So maybe you go on to college, because let's say you say, you know what, let me go to college, let me take all these different kinds of classes and see which one I like. And the, you know, and if I like a certain class, that might suggest to me that maybe I should, should go into that area, right? Or maybe you go to the military, not because you wanna be a military person, but because you just wanna have something to do while you think about it. You know what the rich people do? They travel right after high school. So you know what? Uh, mom, dad, you know, I, I just don't know what I want to be. I don't know if I want to go to college or if I, you know, want to join the family business or, or whatever it is. Uh, you know, why don't, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to travel. I'm going to see the world and then when I come back. Maybe I'll know who I am. That's what the rich people do. Most people cannot afford that. Okay. Travel all over the world. But maybe you go to college and try to figure out maybe to join the military in the meantime, while you think about it, you might find when you join the military that you maybe that is what, who you are but it's also a time for you to reflect and think where you learn a lot also. And when you're in the military, you do get to travel too, okay? But if you just join the military because they tell you that's who you are and that's what you're gonna be, that's identity foreclosure, right? But you didn't really think about it. If you go in there more with an open mind, you're gonna think about it, right? Then that's identity moratorium. Moratorium is like a timeout. You need more time to think. That's what that means. What you ultimately wanna to get to is identity achievement where you have questioning and commitment. In other words, you were worried about your identity, you thought about it, you questioned it, and you also made a decision, okay? That's what it involves. That's ultimately what you want. You wanna make a decision, right? Make a commitment, but it has to do with you thinking about who you really are and not just following what other people tell you. That's what's healthy, identity achievement. That's what James Marshall said. And it makes a lot of sense. Um, here's more about identity. What about religious identity? What happens with religious identity, right? Because we have, you know, our identity is, is kind of complex, involves different things. So what about religious identity? For some people, religious identity doesn't really matter to them. They're just, they're not, they don't believe in anything and they don't have much of an identity, but some people do. Uh, when it comes to religious identity, most adolescents accept broad outlines of parental and cultural identity. What does that mean? That means when it comes to the religious identity, most adolescents just agree with what other people tell them. You grow up in a Christian family, guess what? You're a Christian, right? That's who you are. And uh, no questioning, right? If you're Muslim, right? Then you're Muslim and you know that's who you are. That's your religious identity. If you're Jewish, you're Jewish. If you're Catholic, you're Catholic. Christianity, by the way, is broad, includes Catholicism and evangelicals and Baptists and many different kinds of Christianity. Muslims are a whole different other religion. And so is Jew you know, Judaism. Um, there's other religions, but what research shows about um, uh, religious identity when it comes to adolescence is not a very flattering thing. It's not a very uh, 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 good thing that basically most adolescents don't really think about it that much. They just accept what their parents and society tells them. In some countries, it's the whole country that that's how they are and you just fall in line and believe what they believe. 
the healthy thing would be for you to question it, think about it on your own, and then eventually, you know, make up your own mind. And you may come back to what your parents actually believe, but at least you questioned it. At least you thought about it on your own. You didn't just accept it, so to speak. But some people never question it. And they're very hardcore, so to speak, very devout, or they say they are, you know, and, um, you know, and they have their beliefs. And sometimes their beliefs, by the way, uh, don't really support uh, other beliefs that, that are part of the religion. Um, here's the thing I got to tell you guys about religion in general, okay? Um, a lot of people consider themselves certain type of religion, stuff like that, but there's so much variation among people that they practice religion in different ways. I'll give you an example. Not all Christians believe the same thing. Yes, there is the thing, right? right? Like it says right there for that girl, Jesus, right? That's the common thing, right? They all believe in Jesus. But when it comes to anything else, who they vote for, a lot of people pro-Trump, a lot of people anti-Trump, right? Or what they choose to believe, right? And what they choose to, uh, to ignore, right? That's another issue, right? Think about it, right? What do you believe when it comes to your religious identity? Is it, is it really have to do with your thought or are you just going along with the group, right? You've been told maybe as a hardcore Christian, whatever it is, you're Christian, you're evangelical, whatever it is, and you should vote for Trump. Think about it. Is that consistent with your beliefs? Who the hell is Trump? Is he even a Christian, right? But that's what happens when you don't think. And I'm not telling you you shouldn't vote for him because what I'm telling you here is that different religious groups, right, whether they're Christian or whatever it is, aren't always consistent with their intended beliefs and they don't always act like everybody else. There's some that support Trump, some that are totally against him, right? The point is, it's good to think about these things on your own, not just be led away by the group. Think about things on your own, even your religious identity. It's just something that you need to think about and not just accept what you're told. Specific religious beliefs may be questioned. Yeah, some people question, like, why the hell are we voting for Trump? Or why the hell are we supposedly for Trump? That doesn't fit, fall in line with our beliefs. Look at the man, right? Other people say, well, yes, he does because of this, this, and this. But they question things. Or they question the thing about gay marriage. Hey, man, why are we so much against gay marriage? What's the big deal with that, right? Some people do question it. But... What research says about religious identity is that most adolescents just believe what their parents tell them, what they learn at church, what other people tell them, right? That whatever their group is, even their political group has often a lot to do with their religious identity. And I'm telling you that that is not as healthy, not so flattering. You need to think about this on your own, right? Question it, think about it, right? And then ultimately you make up your own decision, right? Make up your own mind, which might, it might lead you back to where you started. That's what happened with me. I questioned the whole thing when I was an adolescent. I didn't want to go to church. I didn't believe. I was agnostic. So you know what? I don't know. I haven't made up my mind, right? I, uh, you know, I questioned things. And eventually, I came right back. Right? I do consider myself a Christian. That doesn't mean, however, that I support certain beliefs or certain politicians, by the way, all right? Because I don't always fall in line with the group. I decide for my own what it really means to be that. And I don't just, I'm not just led away by people's opinions, okay? You have to think, all right? Always question things. Um, political identity, here's something that really bothers me, all right? Political identity, right? I don't like politics at all. But yes, there is also political identity, right? Uh, most adolescents, again, just like with the religious identity, they just follow parental political traditions. Guess what? You're raised in a Republican family, you're gonna be Republican for the most part. Adolescents are just gonna follow what their parents say. That's what the research says. If you're in a democratic family, right? You're going to be democratic, right? Uh, there are some that will question their parental political views and will go against uh, their, their parents' political identity. There are people like that say, you know what? Yeah, I come from, come from a very conservative family, right? And they're all pro-Trump or pro this or that. And I, I don't believe that. I know I'm totally the other way, right? That does happen too. Um, when it comes to political identity, though, uh, adolescents tend to be more liberal with their parents. Again, with the issue like about gays and gay marriage and all that kind of stuff, adolescents are more accepting of that. The older generation, the parents, not as much. So there can be, you know, uh, how should I say, um, exceptions where they'll follow a certain political identity, but they don't really believe in this part of it, right? The whole anti-gay marriage thing, nah, man, that's messed up. I don't believe in that. Or it might be the other way, right? Maybe you have a uh, you know, someone who's more liberal, but they don't like the whole abortion thing and they say they're pro-choice, right? 
by the way, fanatical political religious movement participation is rare. It's rare that you have these people who are extremely like, uh, like who are extreme, by the way, like the people who are on, on, the, on the fringes, you know, the, the people who are extremely um, for one thing or another so much uh, that they basically, uh, they wanna get rid of the other side. They wanna kill the other side, right? Those are the extremists. Right, we talk about extremists like they only exist in other countries, right? We talk about religious extremists like over there in the Middle East, you know, the people who are trying to blow us up and who hate us and stuff like that. Yeah, guess what? We have them here too. And there may be people just like you, they often are, right? People on the both right and left, we have religious extremists, really, or political extremists, right? Extremely liberal, extremely conservative, or extremely religious on this side or that side. And they are so extreme that they want to get rid of the other group. And they'll kill people and bomb people. And that, that's, that's actually rare. Well, you don't have to bomb people to be extreme, but it's rare that people are really extreme. Most people, by the way, are, are somewhere in the middle. You know, they're, you can talk to them, okay? But there are some people who are very fanatical and extremism, where it's religious, religious extremism or political extremism, is a, extremism, by the way, is a very unhealthy thing. And, and by the way, actually, I think we're getting more and more of that. And that's why we're so divided as a country. It's a crazy thing. Okay, it's a very awful thing to be an extremist, religious extremist, political extremist. It's what leads to freaking war. Okay, just so you understand, it leads to suicide. It leads to people killing each other. It leads to civil war. We need to stop that religious extremism, the political extremism. Right? We need to be more open, right, and think for ourselves, and be accepting of others. And the messed up thing is, we're really disagreeing with about we're disagreeing with people about just what they believe when it comes to our behavior. Most of us are the same way, but there we are fighting about our beliefs that in reality, we don't even follow ourselves, okay? That's the problem, okay? Extremism is a very dangerous thing, and it's not just a, con a problem in other countries. I want to really make that point. It's a problem here too, okay? Big problem. And we're getting more and more people getting on the, extreme, uh, on the extremes, but the majority of us are not that extreme. But who do we hear about on Facebook or on Twitter or in the news? The extremists. It seems like they are more popular than they actually are. And they're not as popular. Those militias that you hear about, right? Most people are not in militias. They're a small minority. You shouldn't be afraid of them, okay? As long as the government doesn't support them, they're not gonna do anything, okay? Well, they will try to do something, but I mean, they're not gonna take over, is what I'm telling you guys. But political identity, right? You need to make sure that, um, don't be extreme, okay? Most adolescents identify also with their own ethnicity and what their ethnicity says, you know, like, uh, for instance, most Latinos are gonna be, uh, you know, Democrat. Most black people, Democrat, right? More white people are on the Republican side. You know, ethnicity also affects your political identity. It doesn't mean that you're, just because you're Latino doesn't mean you can't be Republican. There are Republican Latinos, maybe about 30% of them. Uh, and there are also white people who are Democrats, maybe like, maybe like 40 something percent of them, but most of them are Republican. And all that affects your political identity. But I really think it's stupid that we even adhere to political identity because politics is corrupt, okay? It's just an awful thing, right? It just divides us. It's a really awful thing. We have more in common than the political parties would like us to believe. Here's something uh, more useful, your vocational identity. Vocational means has to do with the job, right? What are you gonna do with yourself? What's your work gonna be? What's your career gonna be? That's vocational identity. Vocational identity takes years to establish nowadays, okay? It's not like in the past where you came out of high school and you knew right away what you were gonna do. Nope, now you come out of high school and you don't know what the hell to do with yourself. A lot of people go to college, take years to figure it out. Other people do other things, but usually you're not, you don't really know when you're 18 years old or even when you're 16. So that's gonna take years to develop. You're gonna go into your 20s and then eventually, probably when you're in your 20s, you'll figure it out. Some people don't even figure it out until they're in their 30s. Um, but, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, most people really don't know. They have a kind of a clue, but they don't really know. Early vocational identity is no longer relevant. You know, those jobs that you take early on when you, you know, those part-time jobs, that's not really going to be your vocational identity, right? Whether you work at, you know, at Starbucks or let's say you work at, uh, a Target or Costco or something like that, that's probably not who you are. That's a temporary job, right? To try to make ends meet while you're trying to figure things out. Your career is gonna take years to establish, right? Your vocational identity takes years to establish, okay? That's just the way it is nowadays. 
Part-time work during high school is often related to negative outcomes. You know that part-time work? Research shows that, like I told you guys before, that most of that money earned, you know, uh, you know, while you work in high school, it's used for clothes and drugs and junk food and shoes and, you know, entertainment, things like that. It's actually not used for very productive things. But that's vocational identity. What about gender identity, right? Something that's getting controversial. It shouldn't be controversial, okay? Gender identity. Gender identity begins with a person's sex. At first, it starts with, you know, whether you're male or female, or maybe you're somewhere in between. That's what it starts with, right? And then it leads to a gender role, leads to ideas about what it's like, what, it, you know, what males are like and what females are like. Or if you're somewhere in the middle or you're bisexual or whatever it is, um, you know, that, uh, that happens later, right? It may be questioned, your gender identity. Some people do question their gender identity, right? And question whether it's okay, you know, uh, you know to act a certain way, even if, uh, you know, that's not the stereotype, right? Gender roles are actually changing everywhere, okay? Uh, people question them more now, and it's not just in this country, in other countries, but like, for instance, like, should males wear makeup, right? Maybe don't think about it here. Here in the U.S., it's like, okay, no males don't wear makeup. That's a thing for females, right? Um, go to South Korea, and you'll see that males there, according to what I've read, uh, they, they, they're the ones who, uh, who use makeup more than the females, <laughs> because it's a more acceptable thing there for males to use makeup, right? And they, and, and they have more of these uh, in-between kind of uh, uh, gender, so to speak. Uh, we're we're re learning more and more that it's not strictly masculine and feminine. There's a bunch of stuff in the middle, okay? Uh, the DSM-5 says that there's such a thing as gender dysphoria when people are distressed about their biological sex. In other words, you could have a male, for instance, who feels that maybe that, that he is more female and doesn't identify with males and wants to be, and, and wants to be more feminine. Or you might have a female, biologically female that considers themselves more masculine wants to be more male you have people like that and when it really worries them and causes problems that's called gender dysphoria it might be the the, the problems that it causes might be so bad that some of them might decide down the road that they want to have a sex change but most people will not by the way most people will eventually you know uh accept who they are and accept that gender roles don't have to be uh you know just masculine and feminine. You can be somewhere in the middle. And that's how you can resolve a lot of that conflict is by basically just accepting who you are and not just agreeing with the traditional notions of what it's like, what it's a man is or what a woman is. Uh, there's a lot of in between actually. It's always bad not to think for yourself, okay? Um, all right, let's talk about other things uh, that, you know, other than identity, let's talk about family and friends. So a lot of self-destructive behaviors can be avoided with the support of family and friends. Maybe you have gender dysphoria, or maybe you have other issues with identity, right? If you have a loving family, loving friends, right? Uh, for the most part, you'll be okay if you get the support you need. So adolescents often seek out the companionship they need. They will seek out, you know, uh, others uh, so that they can feel better and be, be better able to cope with things. And as uh, adolescents, get, as they get older, they become increasingly detached from their parents and older adults. Eventually, you know, they, what they do is they care less and less about what mommy and daddy thinks, and they care more about what people like them think, right? People their age, because they're the relevant comparison group. Are you really gonna listen to mom when it, when it comes to, when you're an adolescent, right? When it comes to, you know, what kind of clothes you should wear? If you do, guess what? You're gonna be out of style, okay? And people are gonna tease you about that. You probably care more about what your peers say, right? Or what they're wearing, right? It's the same thing with other things, not just what you wear and how you wear your hair and stuff like that, but also opinions about other things, about other matters, you know? Um, there is something called a generation gap and that's the distance in between the values, behaviors of an older and younger generation. There's been research suggests that there's, you know, that, the, you know, that there is a, a generation gap that that younger people do tend to think a lot, you know, a lot different than, uh, than the older generation, right? Like different music, prefer to wear different types of clothes. Uh, even politically, they can be different, a bit more liberal. Even if they do uh, still um, adhere to the same political group, they can be a bit more liberal than the older generation, okay? Uh, there's research that says that. Uh, but turns out the generation gap is not as wide as we would think it is. Generation gap is not actually as large as most people think it is. Younger and older generations have similar values 
and aspirations, if you compare adolescents to their own parents, like we said, adolescents tend to be similar to their own parents as far as identity and political identity and religious identity. Uh, but when we look overall, it seems to be that younger people are a lot more different than the older generation. It, but when you could just compare people to their own, you know, to their own parents, adolescents' own parents, um, there's a lot of similarities. Okay, adolescents and parents, uh, um, and, th and there's also differences in how they view family interactions. Okay, so adolescents and parents view family interactions differently. Like for instance, like your idea about a curfew is a curfew necessary, right? I mean, younger generation is more likely to believe like, hey man, what the heck with the curfew? Let us go to sleep whenever we want to when we're tired, right? And parents might say, no, 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 it's important that you go to bed at a certain time. You have school, you need to get up early, you need to go to bed at a certain time, right? Uh, so there's different views on this and that's part of the generation gap, by the way. But uh, so the curfew is seen as an attempt to protect by parents, right? To guide you, right? Uh, you know, protect you so you're ready for school and you know, so you can, so things will work out better for you, right? Uh, but it's seen as controlled by adolescents. You know, it's like, hey, mom, dad, what's up, man? Why do I have to go to bed at 10? Why can't I go to bed at midnight or whenever the hell I want, right? They see it as unfair. That's different viewpoints, right? From, uh, from, a, di from a different generation, right? That's, that's an example of the generation gap, okay? Uh, most parents believe their children are good and loyal despite the fact that they can be rebellious and they have those raging hormones, right? And most adolescents believe their parents mean well, even, uh, even though they consider them old fashioned and out of touch. So there are differences in beliefs and the, the way they perceive things and what's fair, what's not fair, right? That's part of the generation gap, but they're not as far apart from each other as you might think, especially if you compare adolescents to their own parents, right? If you compare adolescents in general to just the older generation, then they seem very different. Uh, family and friends, okay. Uh, there is a parent-adolescent conflict, right? You are gonna have problems that, as an adolescent um, with your parents. Uh, the teenage years are a very difficult time when it comes to parenting. It's difficult on the teenagers, also difficult on the parents. It is very, very difficult, okay? There, there is parent-adolescent conflict, conflicts between parents and adolescents, right? It emerges in early adolescence, starts early, right? You can start at 13, 14, you know, 15, right? Um, especially with early maturing daughters and their mothers, right? When you have a daughter, right? She might only be 14 or 15, but she looks like a full grown woman and she has these older men hitting on her and she wants to go out and she wants to party and do all this stuff. And the mother usually says, no, no, no. Who the hell do you think you are? You're not ready for that. It can be a lot of problems because of that. Because the daughter looks more mature than she actually is. And she wants more freedom. And there'll be a lot of bickering, a lot of problems, okay? Uh, that bickering is usually trivial things, arguments like uh, nagging about the room, the haircut, clothes, curfew, right? Nagging about the room, like, why don't you clean your room? What's, what's wrong with you, right? Or you think you're going to wear your hair that way? No, 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 that's not acceptable. Or you're going to go out in that? Like, no, no way. That shows way too much skin, right? No, I don't want people ogling you and things like that or ogling you, however you say it, right? Uh, and there'll be a lot of bickering because of that. Mostly trivial stuff, stuff that's not really that important. But they'll argue a lot about these things, okay? Parents see this as an expression of concern. I'm worried about you. I want to keep you safe, right? Adolescents see this unfair judgment. You know, why do you have to judge the way I look? and the clothes I wear. Why do you have to judge me, right? That kind of stuff, right? So they see things differently. Bickering, right? These arguments, right? They peak early uh, in, in early to mid-adolescence, right? They, they start in the early teens and then by mid-adolescence, you know, 15, 16, they're about as bad as they're gonna be. And then after, what, after that, they kind of subside. You turn 16, 17, you know, you're almost 18, you're almost an adult. And, they, and, then, and then basically they say, you know what? You're almost grown up, so yeah, maybe we should let you uh, go out. Maybe we should let you date. And as they grant you more autonomy, as they grant you basically more freedom, things settle down. That's what happens. It's a losing battle, okay? Eventually, parents realize that, you know, you're almost an adult and they can't stop you. But they're going to try to at the beginning, okay? There's adjustment on both sides. Parents will grant more autonomy, grant you more freedom. And adolescents will basically grant them more respect and more appreciation, right? Your parents care about you. They love you, they're trying to protect you. You need to appreciate that, you need to accept that. They're not just judging you, right? They're not really trying to do that, right? So the parents are gonna give a little bit and you also need to give a little bit too. And that's what happens.
for the most part. More about uh, parent-adolescent conflict. Okay, uh, because of greater emphasis on closeness, right? Because uh, certain cultures are more collectivist, more family-oriented, uh, depend, you know, and, and there's more dependency, right? More collectivism. Chinese, Korean, and uh, Hispanic or Latino cultures don't develop those stormy relationships, those, those uh, that, that uh, conflict, right? That extreme conflict or that conflict until later. So, you know, Asian parents are a little bit stricter with their kids. You know, Latinos also uh, can be a, a quite a bit, uh, a, a bit strict early on. So the adolescents kind of are, you know, do what they're told early on, you know, but it isn't until later that they start challenging you. Like, you know, the Chinese and, and Koreans, for instance, they have very strict parents. Asian Americans have very strict parents. But when they do get old enough, they will start challenging the parents' authority. Not all of them, but they, I mean, they will start saying, hey, come on, dad, come on, mom, I'm almost grown up here. You need to let me go out. You need to let me date, right? Same thing with Latinos, right? It isn't until a, bit, a little bit later that you start challenging your parents. Probably because you probably because by that time you're you're almost as big as they are, or maybe as big as they are, and you realize that uh, you have more power than you think you do, right? That if you wanted to, you could walk the hell out of there, and they can't stop you, right? They can try, but they probably won't succeed. Especially as with Latinos, right? You know, you're raising this, uh, you know, these these kids, and eventually you have this uh, Latin the, this teenager there that's as big as you are, or maybe even bigger than you, because every generation gets a little bit taller, and uh, and eventually, you know, they challenge you and you realize that there's not much you can do, right? I remember with my relationship with my mother, my mom was very strict, very mean, you know, and I, I was raised by a frustrated single mother. And yeah, I did what I was told for the most part. And every now and then I still get in trouble and my mom would beat me and whip me with a belt and things like that. Um, there came a time when I was about maybe 16 or so, or maybe 17, where I was big enough and strong enough that I basically said, no more, right? You're not gonna beat me anymore. I'm not accepting this, right? Where I just grabbed her arm. It's like, uh-uh, you're not beating me with that belt anymore. And that might seem as a sign of disrespect, but it basically, what it meant is that, you know, I'm standing up for myself and she had to back down and that's what happened. And that's what ultimately happens, you know, is like as a parent, you eventually have to back away and let them grow up and grant them that freedom. But you try to hold them back a little bit. You wanna make sure they don't grow up too quickly and get into trouble. Okay, but they will challenge you eventually. Former teen mothers tend to be too harsh or too permissive, right? If you were a teenage mother, right? Um, usually what happens is that you don't want your kids to make the same mistakes that you did. So you might be too mean to them. Or maybe you don't believe in rules that much at all. And maybe you're too permissive and then they get into trouble just like you did early on, okay? If the conflict reaches the point of a runaway or a throwaway where the parent basically says, you know what, get the hell out of my house. You don't know, agree with my rules, get the hell out of here, right? That's when you throw them away, so to speak, right? Or they run away, basically they challenge you and you don't wanna give in and they basically say, you know what, screw this, I'm out of here. You know, when it gets to that point where basically they leave the home, either because you kick them out or because they basically say, you know what, I don't wanna deal with this anymore, I don't wanna live here anymore, right? Uh, that's a problem, right? Remember, we're dealing with adolescents. It might be 15, 16 or whatever it is, maybe even 17, and they're not yet ready to take on the world, right? They're not ready to take care of themselves. If they do run away, right, or they do leave, a lot of what follows, right, will be indiscriminate sex, drug use, violence, suicide, right? They're not ready yet. And so you have to kind of, uh, you have to back down as a parent a little bit, grant them a little bit more freedom, you know, compromise a little bit more so that they, you can stay there so you can still continue to have influence instead of them just saying, screw this, right, I'm out of here. And in that case, you won't have any influence anymore and they'll get into trouble for the most part. Some of them still not still turn out okay if, you know, if they basically leave home and they decide to take care of themselves, but most are just not ready. And, and the outcomes are usually not good. I mean, we're talking prostitution, we're talking drug use, violence, delinquency, right? Unprotected sex and you know, STDs and things like that, usually not a good outcome, okay? Parents are there to protect their kids. And, you know, you kind of have to, there has to be a little bit of give and take and you, so you can continue to be influential and continue to guide them. Conflict is part of growing up and, it's, and, and, and so is becoming independent, okay? The rules must adjust accordingly. Your job as a parent is to take care of your kids and guide them and make sure they're ready for adulthood. And what happens is you let them go little by little. You loosen the reins a little bit, little by little, right? You give grant them a little bit more freedom. Like I said, you have to be very strict with young kids. They don't know what they're doing. They can get into a lot of trouble, get hurt. Adolescents need a little bit more freedom, 
And as they get closer and closer to that age of 18, right, uh, they're granted more and more freedom because when they turn 18, literally you can't stop them anymore. You can try, right? And if you do, you know, if they do listen to you, maybe you can still, you know, they'll still listen to you. But if they wanted to, they don't have to listen anymore once they're 18. Other family issues, um, there's also the issue of parental monitoring. Parental ma monitoring is when you monitor your children, right? You want to be aware of what they're doing, where they are, and, you know, who they're with, right? That's parental monitoring. You're checking up on them, right? Uh, research shows that it, it's a positive thing. Um, you know, it helps limit alcohol, drugs, and promote safety, right? You know, you call them, you check up on them, and you say, you want to tell, hey, where are you, right? Who are you with, right? Are you doing anything else we're doing? Are you drinking? You're doing drugs? No, mom, I'm okay, you know, that kind of stuff. It helps keep them safe, right? And it's a lot easier now, by the way, now that we have these smartphones. They can know exactly where you are, right? And you could do FaceTime, right? Oh, you said you're with so-and-so, right? Well, show, put them on the screen. I want to see them. And, 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 and then move the screen around the room. I want to see who else is there, right? I want to see if you're, you're trying to hide anything, right? You can do quite a bit of monitoring if you wanted to, right? But too much parental monitoring uh, is predictive of adolescent depression. If you overdo it and you're always checking up on your kids and you're very strict and you're always checking up on them and you don't grant them any freedom, basically, and you don't trust them, then you're more likely to make your teenagers depressed, right? Uh, because they feel like they're basically in prison that they're not free, okay? And they tend to get depressed. It, it happens a lot, especially with, uh, by the way, those that are Asian because their parents can be quite strict. I, I've, I've had students, for instance, that have Asian parents. They're in college already, they're like 21 years old and their parents still don't let them go out, still don't let them date. Like what the heck is going on, 21 and they still don't wanna let you grow up? Like, I'm sorry, but uh, it's, it's time for you, for you to let your kids <laughs> do some of these things, okay? But anyway, if you, it, but we're still talking about adolescence. If, if you overdo it with the monitoring, with the controlling thing, uh, checking up on them, right? Um, you can make your teenagers depressed or you can make them rebel and say, screw you, I'm not gonna take this anymore. Adolescents need some freedom to feel competent, right? To feel like they can do things on their own. To, they need to feel trusted. They need to feel loved, right? You need to trust them. When they violate that trust, of course, you can take some of that freedom away, but you need to try it and see how they handle it. It's hard for parents to show involvement, right? right? To want to check up on their kids without interference, right? Without, to show concern, without suspicion. You have to kind of, um, uh, well, it, it, it's a compromise, so to speak. Uh, you, have, you have to kind of uh, walk a fine line, right? Where you have to make sure you're checking up on your kids, make sure you're keeping them safe, but at the same time, don't be too controlling. No one likes it if you're too controlling, right? and you don't let your kids do anything or you always want them to do what you want, okay? Communication is important, right? But it should not make the teenager feel guilty or anxious, right? It can lead to distress or rebellion. It can lead to them feeling depressed, right? And bummed out, you're always yelling at them, always accusing them of them, them. you don't trust them, always checking up on them, right? But it could also lead to rebellion, right? Um, Especially if you use that authoritarian parent where you're really mean and strict, right? It can lead to rebellion where they say, you know what? Screw you. I'm out of here, right? And you can't stop me. Um, authoritative parenting is best. The kind of parenting where you show them love, right? You encourage them, right? You have rules. You enforce rules. Uh, but you also explain rules to them. And you, and you basically, you know, you change the rules as they get older, right? You need to... Uh, you need to let your children grow up and still guide them and support them. It's a lot harder said, a lot harder, uh, it's a lot harder to do than, than it is to say, okay? It's hard. <laughs> um, let's talk about family closeness. What are the keys to family closeness? Okay, there are people who are families that are very close. And by the way, and if you are a very close family, then it'll be a lot easier for you to check, check up on your kids, right? A lot easier for you to get along with them It'll be easier to trust your kids and they trust you and, uh, and they won't necessarily feel depressed you know, when you're checking up on them, and, right? They'll know, it, they'll see it as the, for what it really is that you care about them. So family closeness is actually more important than family conflict and individual autonomy. It's more important than granting your kids fr freedom, right? If you're close as a family, right? Uh, then it will help alleviate a lot of the problems. And uh, here are the keys, right? You need communication, right? Do family members talk openly with one another? Will your teenagers tell you, for instance, when uh, they've had sex or if they're thinking about it, right? 
Will they ask you about contraception? Are you gonna tell them about that? You know, that communication is important, right? If they have a problem with someone, with a, let's say in a relationship or with a friend or something, are they gonna tell you, right? Are you that close? Communication is important or are they gonna keep it to themselves, right? Is there support? Do you rely on each other, right? Do you help them, right? So to speak, you know, and uh, you know, do you love each other, right? And, and support each other. They can help out at home with chores and things like that. And of course you help them out, you know, by, you know, giving them some money to spend when they go out or, uh, or help them out providing advice, all sorts of things, right? That's support. Also connectedness, how emotionally close are you, right? Do you trust each other? Do you love each other, right? Do you feel connected or do you feel like you're just uh, on your own, so to speak, and that you're in prison, right? And you can't wait to be an adult so you can be free. Uh, control, how much do control is there? Uh, do parents restrict autonomy or do they, you know, do they let you, you know, be with your friends? Do they let you go out? Do they let you, uh, you know, do the things that you should be doing as, a, as an adolescent? Or are they too controlling and don't let you do anything? Parental monitoring, which we talked about, right? Mutual, uh, close parent-child interaction is most effective monitoring. Um, if you are close with your kids, parental monitoring is not going to be an issue. You won't, you're not even gonna have to call them to check up on them. They're gonna call you and they're gonna tell you what's going on and who they're with, right? If you're that close that they always wanna keep you in the loop, so to speak, it won't seem so intrusive. But if they don't trust you, right? If you're not very connected, not very close, then you are gonna have to do a lot more parental monitoring. You're gonna be calling them and you're gonna be asking the questions, check it out, and that will seem more intrusive. But family closeness is key and those are the uh, five things it has to do with. Let's talk about peers. Peers are those of a, of a similar age. Those that are basically like you. They tend to be similar, you, not just in age, but also, uh, you know, the social economic status, similar because they live in similar neighborhood, in a similar neighborhood, similar economic level, right? And ethnicity often matters as well. And even uh, they tend to be the same sex as you for the most part, right? Females usually, you know, consider their peers to be other females their age. Uh, um, so that's what, those would be peers. Now, friendships are a, a bit more special and friendships are crucial during an early adolescence, okay? They're very important. They get more and more important. Uh, friendships become more personal, right? They're no longer just about play. Uh, you know, now they're about, uh, you know, they're, they're a lot about a lot of things. You know, they're about advice. They're about helping each other out, uh, about uh, protecting each other, you know, uh, you know, advice about dating and all sorts of things, right? And friendships are more durable. They tend to last, uh, these friendships tend to last years. And sometimes they last into adulthood and, and, they, and you stay friends uh, even, even when you grow up and get married and have your own kids, okay? Uh, peer pressure is social pressure to adopt identities, right? That pressure to look a certain way, to act a certain way, right? To have a certain attitude, certain style, to behave a certain way, right? Peer pressure, right? rises in early adolescence and until about 14 and then declines. It tends to be uh, very influential in early adolescence. You know, you're 12, 13, uh, 14. I mean, you really care about what other people think and how they act and you wanna be like them, right? But then eventually you get a little bit older and you start thinking for yourself a little bit and then it's not as influential, but it can still be quite influential. You know, at 15, 16, 17, right? Uh, still is, right? There's a lot of peer pressure, okay? But peers are also helpful, right? Peers help, uh, you know, uh, the uh, adolescent transition between childish behavior and adults, right? They help you grow up, so to speak. I mean, if you're still letting, if as a teenager, you're still letting your parents decide what you wear, uh, they're going to notice that. And they're going to ask you, hey, does mom still buy your clothes? Like, really? You don't, like, you don't have a say? You don't, I mean, you don't tell her what you want and she gets what you want. I mean, uh, they help, you know, get you current, right? Up to date as far as fashion, but also as far as what you, how you should behave, you know, and what you, and, and, and what kind of music that, you know, to listen to and all stuff, they, they, they help inform you about lots of different things. Okay. And they help you grow up. They really do. Okay. Uh, friends usually encourage desirable behavior. That's the good news about peers and friends is that usually encourage uh, desirable behavior, not peers, friends, right? Usually encourage desirable behavior. Um, peer standards are not always negative. We hear a lot about peer pressure in the negative sense, but it's, it could also be a positive thing. Friends teach you to stand up for yourself, right? They teach you that you're all right, you know? 
um, that you are smart, that you're not as bad as you think you are, or what people tell you, they protect you. Um, they usually encourage good behavior. They can encourage bad behavior, okay? Peers can engage in behaviors that neither would do alone. They can cause trouble. Uh, you know, like there's a bunch of teenagers, right? Uh, male, especially get together. Uh, it can usually lead to problems. They start acting stupid. They start doing risky things, things like that, that can happen as well. They'll do things that they wouldn't do if they weren't with their friends or with their peers, right? Um, but, it, but that doesn't always happen. Uh, peer pressure is more likely to be negative under certain circumstances. Like if you're new to a certain school, you don't know how to behave yourself. Then you're more vulnerable to basically following a certain group that may not provide a good model for behavior or for how you should be, right? Um, or if you're just starting puberty, right? Early adolescence, you know, peer pressure is very strong because it, it's everything is different, right? Everything feels different. Uh, you have different ways of thinking and uh, you're more likely to be led away uh, by other people's opinion. You're more likely to admire aggressive people, drug users or things like that, or people who just want to party, oh, they're cool or whatever it is. Uh, no, they're not. Those people are not cool, okay? It's just that that's what you believe when you're a teenager, right? You know people who should be cool, you should consider cool, the smart people, right? That's who you should consider cool. But in reality, it's not always that way. The, a lot of people we consider cool are the ones who don't care about school. Like, yeah, whatever, man. It's like, it, I don't follow, I, I just don't do that, you know? Or the people who use drugs or are having sex already, you know? Or the people who are just want to party. Like you tend to think of those people as cool, as rebels or whatever it is, but in reality, uh, they're not, okay? And you shouldn't necessarily be following their behavior. Not a, you know, it's just not, not a good thing, okay? Um, but you're more likely to be led away in those, under that you know, negative peer pressure when things are new, when you don't know what to think. But most, uh, most uh, adolescents will actually associate with similar others and uh, people with, that have similar interests. Here's the good news about adolescents. A lot of parents worry and stuff like that. If you have a good kid, you know, and you know they're a good kid, guess what? They're gonna find other friends that are mostly good kids. Okay, you know, your nerdy, uh, smart kid is not going to be hanging out with the gangsters, with the jocks or anything like that. They're not going to fit into those groups. They're going to find people like themselves. If your kid is a badass, you know, and someone who is like that, yeah, they're going to find other people like themselves. Okay, but for the most part, you know, uh, people end up finding others like themselves. And most people are not that bad. Unlike what G. Stanley Hall said, right? Most teenagers, yeah, they'll do some bad things here and there, but most of them are not that bad. Most of them are not delinquents, not criminals. Most of them are not having sex or using drugs. That's, that's the reality. We tend to exaggerate the extent to which, uh, you know, peer pressure is negative. It can also be positive. More about peer pressure. Most peer-inspired uh, adolescent misbehavior is actually short-lived. Yeah, they'll do some bad things, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean it will lead to long-term delinquency. Even me, when I was... Uh, when I was an adolescent, right? Yeah, I, uh, I skipped school a couple of times because I was encouraged. I went to a couple of, uh, you know, ditch parties, so to speak, where instead of going to school, you go to a party and it's basically you're at somebody's house and they're having a party because their parents are at work and nobody's there, right? And instead you're having a ditch party or something like that, right? Um, yeah, I might have shoplifted a few times, you know, grabbed a few things that uh, I shouldn't have, but you know, I didn't turn into a criminal, right? I was encouraged by, you know, people here and there, right? That dared me and, you know, might've walked out with a, you know, a candy bar or something like that from Walmart or something, you know, but yeah, I, I, I had a little bit of that, just a little tiny bit. I could have gone into trouble, but uh, it wasn't anything that was a big deal. And that's the way it is for most people. They'll do some bad things here and there, but most of them are not that bad. Peers allow adolescents to actually experiment with possible selves, right? to actually learn about themselves and, and, and resolve, help them resolve their identities. Peers actually deflect and defense against adult criticism. Your peers are the ones who are gonna make you feel better uh, when your mom and dad are unfair or they're really making you feel bummed out. They're the ones who are gonna defend you when those other people are mean to you. If they're real friends, right? Even your peers can stick up for you, right? So, you, I mean, a lot of it is positive, but it can be negative. But you should know as a parent, you know, who you're with, as, who you have as, as a kid, you know? Um, and remember when you were a teenager, right? What were you like? Chances are they are similar. And if you were a badass, uh, don't give a damn about anything, I'll do whatever I want. Uh, don't be surprised if your teen wants to be the same way, right? It doesn't mean you can't influence them in a positive way. Um, 
but you have to be aware of what your teen is really like and know the capacity for them to really get into trouble, right? If you can really trust them, or if you have someone who's just going to, the moment you look away, they're gonna be doing something that you don't want them to do. Most of it is just stupid, silly behavior, okay? It's not that bad. Let's talk about romance. What about romance during the teenage years? It's something that, you know, it happens. It happens to a lot of people. First romances typically appear in high school, right? Yeah, there's some that might have boyfriends and girlfriends in junior high, but usually by high school. And remember high school starts at about, it starts at like ninth grade now, right? And these teenage romances rarely last more than a year. Most of them are not that serious and they don't last that long. They're trying to kind of figure things out. They're experimenting, so to speak, you know? I remember having relationships and uh, you know, some of them lasted two weeks. Some of them lasted two months. Uh, the most any relationship lasted for me in high school was like two months. And I was, I felt kind of bummed out about that because I saw other people that were with someone for a year, two years, and it seems like they were gonna be stay together and get married. And I felt kind of like, you know, why the hell aren't things working out for me? Turns out that's kind of typical. Most of these relationships, these early romances don't last that long. It's actually rare when you stay together for years and then you, you graduate and you get married. That usually doesn't happen. Most people just have, a, you know, a romance here and there, it doesn't work out, fizzles out and, uh, and they move on to somebody else. And it's not usually until they're older, they have more serious relationships, okay? Girls are more likely to claim a steady partner more often than boys. Girls are more likely to say that, that they have a boyfriend and stuff like that, and the boys are less likely to deny it. Say, nah, nah, we're just friends with them. Like, no, man, I'm not with her and stuff like that. It's like, sometimes they just don't want to admit it, right? Not all romances include intercourse. A lot of them don't, okay? It is a myth that most adolescents are having sex. It's not true. A lot of these relationships that have, don't involve sex at all. Yeah, there could be some kissing, right? Some hugging, maybe some, even a little bit of fondling, right? But most of them do not involve sex. I have plenty of girlfriends in high school. I didn't have sex with any of them, <laughs> to give you some personal information, right? But uh, that is typical of a lot of people, okay? Uh, breakups and unreciprocated crushes are common. Yeah, you'll have crushes on some people and uh, they may never notice you. And when you do have these uh, first romances, right? Uh, they're probably, uh, you know, they're, you're more likely gonna break up eventually. They probably won't last. That's just the way it is, right? And you're gonna feel kind of, you know, sad or maybe even depressed for a little bit. It's, uh, it happens a lot, okay? Adolescents are usually crushed by rejection, sometimes contemplate revenge or suicide, right? I remember the first time a girl dumped me, I was mad. And we became enemies after that because I felt rejected and mad. Like, how dare you? That kind of stuff. I didn't, tell, I didn't tell her how dare you, but it's like, I mean, how can you be friends after that? You know, it's like, <laughs> some people stay friends. Most people do not, okay? Because we're very emotional during this time and we don't take it very well. And those that take it very badly, yeah, can might want to try to hurt the other person, right? And get back at them or, or are likely get, or can get depressed and even suicidal. You need to make sure that you know, that you're checking up on your teens and stuff like that and, you know, and that you're aware of what's happening. More about this. Let's talk about heterosexual relationships uh, in general. They tend to follow a certain pattern. What happens first is you, uh, you know, you're hanging out with a group of friends. You have your friends and they have their friends, right? And they're usually exclusively of the same sex, right? Group of boys over here, group of girls over here, right? And then what happens is that you interact a little bit. Loose association of girls and boys uh, group. And all interactions are very public. In public, you kind of might talk a little bit to each other in groups and stuff like that, uh, but you're still in your own groups, right? Some loose interactions. And then smaller mixed sex groups uh, are kind of formed, right? Where a couple of people might start hanging out a little bit more, right? And then there's a final peeling off of the heterosexual couple where two people of opposite sex decide they're gonna be together and they basically end up leaving those two groups and spending more time with each other. And sometimes, the other people will get mad at you. It's like, hey, we're not good enough for you anymore. But that's what happens when you, when you get together is you basically tend to neglect the other groups if you're really into each other. Homosexual couples follow the same pattern, but they are slower to connect for obvious reasons that we're gonna talk about. Homosexual youth, right? If you're gay or lesbian, uh, you're usually slower to form those romantic attachments, right? Uh, many uh, that are gay, lesbian, whatever you want to call them, right? Um, they're very reluctant to acknowledge their homosexuality early on. Remember, they're very subject to peer influences and mostly you'll see heterosexuality as the norm. And they often will, even if they might have some doubts, they won't want to admit them. They won't want to admit that they're gay or lesbian or bisexual or whatever it is, right? 
Only about a half percent identify as gay or lesbian from ninth to 12th grade. Most of them don't want to openly admit it or identify with that. And they'll try heterosexuality out for a while. They'll try to be straight and then find out later on that it's not who they are, okay? In the general population, it's more like one to 7%, eh, probably close to about maybe 3%, right? But the percentage is a lot lower uh, in high school. And it's because they don't want to admit it. It's not the norm, right? It's not the majority. And, um, you know, and well, they're kind of a little bit ashamed of it. Adolescents first become aware of their homosexual interests at about age 11, right? Right around puberty, right? They start realizing that they're attracted to the same sex, maybe than the opposite sex. They usually don't tell anyone until they're 17. Don't come out of the closet until later, basically. The feelings are often denied, right? They'll deny that they have those feelings, right? They're concealed. They'll hide them through heterosexual involvement. Plenty of teenagers will be in heterosexual relationships, even though they're gay or homosexual. They'll try it out. They don't really know who they are, and they'll find that it doesn't feel quite right, that something seems to be missing, and it's not until later that they'll finally figure it out. Oh, okay, I get it now, right? Um, they'll deny, denying feelings of, you know, can result in depression and even suicide, right? When they deny who they are, they don't want to accept who they are, they feel different, they feel isolated, right? They can be very depressed about that, especially uh, if people don't have very accepting attitudes uh, toward homosexuality which is often the case in people who are very conservative, very religious, okay? People who are, uh, you know, more of a certain political party than another, right? They're more likely to feel less accepted, more likely to get suicidal, okay? Like I said, as a parent, you need to be aware of your teenager, right? And you need to accept them for who they are, right? Regardless of religion, regardless of political orientation or whatever it is, people are who they are, okay? 10% of youth reported same-sex encounters or desires. About 10% uh, report that they had some kind of situation where maybe they kissed a guy, kissed another guy or a girl, another girl, or that they you know, might've thought about it or something like that. Um, they don't go act on it. It doesn't mean they're all gay, but some of them are a little bit curious, but most are not gay or lesbian. Well, a lot of them will hide it early on. Um, communicating about sex. You know what? This is where we'll stop. We have about nine minutes left. So let me stop here and leave this for next time because communication about sex is gonna be a whole nother issue we're gonna talk a lot about.